You got your glasses on now. Now we're serious. Yeah. Uh, welcome, boys and girls, children of all ages, to another exciting episode of Under the Dome. We are now in the doldrums of summer. Mini camp is over. They actually cut it a day short this past week. Um, uh, and they announced the Hall of Fame. Um, two new inductees. We'll talk about that tonight to the Saints Hall of Fame. Uh, and now we have to wait uh, until the end of the month of July, uh, six weeks before real football starts. Uh, they, I think they report, I don't remember the exact date, but I think they report around the 28th. Uh, no, 20th is a Saturday. So I think they report the 26th of July. And the first padded practice, I believe, is the 31st. So, uh, yeah, because the first couple of days, I think you have three days where you're not allowed to wear pads. So they kind of do what we basically saw in the OTAs and the uh, and training, you know, the mini camp. But then the 30th, I mean, the 31st or the 1st should be the first full day of pads. And that's when real football starts up. I'm your host, Alan Rorick, by the way, in case you don't know. Uh, we were just having a good conversation right before we came on the air. Do you remember that? And, and let me just say this before I, we get started on the show. Do you remember that <laughs> videotape series, The Trials of Life? you remember that? It was by Time Life. It was by, you know, the stuff they do in the wild. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was really vicious. Because, you know, they're showing like a attack by a pack of lions. You see a spider, you know, killing the other insects. You see that, you know, the sea turtles trying to escape on each gulls and they was just tearing into them. Uh, and, you know, it was just about how. Basically how a Ted Nugent hunting video. Yeah, exactly. It was a, it was it, well. It was all about how hard it was, you know, just to survive in nature. And I had an animal rights uh, English teacher, and he says, oh, I hate those things. You know, people need to see that kind of stuff. I'm like, it's the way nature is, man. But kind of you despite, on, off despite, the despite a commonly uh, abused narrative these days, life is not rainbows and unicorns uh there's times when it's ugly and more often times than not if you dig deep enough it's survival of the fittest much like an nfl season there you go there you how's go that, how's so we that can for a how, segue man we can, we can tie this stuff together <laughs> But but the the video series you were just talking about that was basically the conversation that we had prior to air tonight. Uh, that's what you were talking about is basically that on super slow mo with uh, different camera angles. It really was. It was. <laughs> it, in all seriousness, I, I wanted to get that series because um, it, you know it was it was incredible footage they showed. You know an eagle defending its nest against a snake or something like that. And it just rips the snake apart. It was unbelievable. You know, and you would think, how could an eagle do that? But you realize how strong its talons are and how strong its beak is. And it just hard and, you know, it was protecting its nest. So it was, it was fascinating. I just, like I said, you know, I'm one of these idiots. You know, if you ever wonder who the idiot is who sits and watches a half hour of uh, those infomercials for Time Life, either, either the music or the, you know, a, a video series like The Trials of Life or something like that. I'm that idiot because I'm the one sitting there watching going, okay, I recognize that. Oh, that was from Mutual Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Oh, I remember, you know, I, I'll sit there and try and remember where that came from. So, anyway, yeah, I, I'll watch that when there's absolutely nothing on my white look. What the hell are you watching? <laughs> I'm on. I'll watch it. We want to thank everybody for joining us tonight uh, on Under the Dome. Uh, as Alan mentioned, we are in what is commonly referred to in our business as the dead season. Uh, there is no draft reports to talk about. There is no OTAs to talk about. There is no training camp 
stuff to talk about. So we shall press forward and create our own content as only we can. Um, uh, well, that, that was a bit of a stretch. I expected to hear like a, a cymbal crash, but anyway, um, yeah. as Alan mentioned, my name is Sean Williams. I'm the co-host to, uh, my esteemed partner there, the, the, uh, the head of knowledge for, for our effort here. Um, Mr. Alan Ulrich, and we want to welcome you to Under the Dome. And we want to thank Fan First Productions for being our sponsor, and we want to invite you guys to subscribe to us on iTunes and on YouTube at Under the Dome Podcast, and as well as look for us on Facebook at Under the Dome Podcast, uh, and on Twitter at Under the Dome PO1, all one word. Uh, and if you'll look at the header of tonight's show on YouTube, all of our Twitter uh, handles are on there if you want to reach out to us individually. And we thank you all once again for joining us. We want to remind you guys, coming up on July the 17th, believe it or not, you, you may not be able to tell that by tonight's episode, but... We are coming up on our two-year anniversary. We will be celebrating that our first show was July 20th of 2016. Wow. Hard to believe, isn't it? It's a long time to sit here and look at my ugly face. That's for damn sure. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled up today just for fun. I pulled up the, uh, the screenshot... You know, anytime after we we go live, it it immediately archives to YouTube the uh, the the, mm -hmm. the playback version, and there's always that one picture up there. Most of the time, it's Alan because when the when the program starts, it's Alan doing the introduction and the welcome, and I pulled it up, and that picture of Alan was like. Oh man, that Alan has to have a younger child that looks like this. Or, uh, oh, and by the way, you give your brother such a hard time. And I got to defend Danny here because I'm a younger brother too. Of course, I'm an older brother as well. I'm much like most uh -huh. other things in life, I'm caught in the middle. But I saw a, uh, a picture of Danny, I think he was with Mickey Mouse. That's entirely possible. He lives in Orlando, so and he used to work at Disney World. Well, I saw a picture of Danny, and it was like, "Oh my God, Alan with dark hair." <laughs> <laughs> I said I was going to tell you that so it'd drive you crazy. Um, and I'll, I, I, I'm I'm sorry. It's the dead period because people are killing us. Um, our anniversary show. I, I apologize. I got sidetracked. Oh, yeah. uh, our anniversary show, as I said, will be July the 17th at 8 p.m. He and his whole family is sit and watch the show. Okay. Danny? Yeah, he, he watches this show. He, uh, he and his family sit and watch the show on a big screen. So I don't know why they do that, but they do. <laughs> well, hey, I, I consider that quality programming. Yeah, Danny, yeah. brother, I'm pulling for you. I anybody that is knowledgeable in wrestling too can't be all that bad. And being the little brother, uh, I, I, I'm I'm defending the faith, brother. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, July the 17th, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, our two year anniversary show. We will be welcoming in a very special guest, someone that we've uh, we've been efforting towards getting on our show, basically from the beginning. Um, the uh, one of the, if I understood correctly, one of the founders of Canal Street Chronicles and their their media stuff, Mr. Kyle Mosley. Uh, he's been doing this for a very very long time, and 
we've never been able to coordinate the schedules, but we're hoping that, uh, that we've worked everything out, all the details, all the planets are going to line up just like they need to. And, uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I, I'm really, really looking forward to to uh, to Kyle joining us. Um, Alan, earlier this week, we had the 2018 mm-hmm. Hall of Saints Hall of Fame class announced. And is it is it at all surprising to you that the the inductees in this class are two? undrafted free agents that are going into the hall of fame for this club? No, not really. I think, I, in fact, I think that's what they uh, target when they get the two undrafted free agents that came in. Now, uh, of course, Pierre Thomas came in 2007 and uh, Lance Moore came in 2005, but they basically both hit their peak with the saints during the Super Bowl years of 2008, 2009, through two, it was kind of their peak years uh, with the club. But uh, I think that's what they were going for. And it's kind of odd to people like me and maybe even you um, because now you're starting to see contemporaries, guys who have been playing with Drew Brees now. It's no longer we're going back to – the 70s players. We're not going back to the 80s players, the Jim Moore teams. We're not going back to, you know, even the early 90s players, uh, you know, uh, like a, um, oh, like a Leroy Glover in the late 90s or Kyle Turley or, um, you know, a uh, Ronaldo Turnbull or people like that. We're not going to those players anymore. We're now starting to go into the Sean Payton years, which kind of, it pretty much shows you how long this man has been the head coach. This is his what thirteenth season starting up here. Uh, I think it's his. Um, I think it's his thirteenth year, but his twelfth season. It's his fourteenth. It's the fourteenth year, but his thirteenth season because okay. Okay. it'll be six. No, you. Eh, they can't. No, you're right. I think you're right. I think thirteenth year, twelfth. Uh, uh, 12th full season because you can't count 2012. So, but anyway, so we're going to start seeing now more and more of the players from the Super Bowl years uh, getting into the Hall of Fame. You'll see Jonathan Vilma soon. You'll see Marcus Colston, uh, you know, Tracy Porter may end up in the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, Jabari Greer, you're going to start seeing those players coming into the Hall of Fame. John Stinchcomb, uh, you know, because last year it was Carl Nix and uh, who was the other one? It was Carl Nix and somebody else. I thought it was Vilma. Was it Vilma? Yeah, it was. It was Vilma and Carl Nix. You're right. You're right. I had to think back on that. So, you know, I think that's where we were going with this. And you know, Pierre Thomas, I think clearly he belonged in the Saints Hall of Fame just because of the screen pass. You know, his he you could almost rename the screen pass the Pierre Thomas play because Thomas made that a lethal weapon for the Saints. As good as Reggie Bush was, as good as Deuce McAllister was running the screen, as good as, um, you know, uh, uh, Darren Sproles, even – with uh, Alvin Kamara on the team now, as good as those guys are running the screen, nobody ran the screen like Pierre Thomas did. Nobody you know, it could be third and 13, and Pierre Thomas is picking up that first down on a screen pass, and he gets hit three yards left before he gets the first hit, hits, spins off that hit, and then falls forward. Just to get just enough to get that first down. It was amazing how well he did. And uh, you know, I, I there was a question on um Twitter the other day if you could go back in time and take one play in sports your franchise's sports history and change it to change history, what play would it be? And I think it was just said that uh 
instead of Dante Whitner knocking Pierre Thomas out in that 2011 playoff game against the 49ers, Pierre Thomas bounces off a Whitner hit and scores a touchdown. And in his mind, the game is completely different. You know, because now the 49ers are playing behind the whole game. And that offense was not designed to play from behind. And at that point in time, they're really, I, I mean, Sproles was what he was, but he wasn't that line up in the backfield and get you what you need type of running back that Kamara is, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. The point I'm trying to make is behind uh, Pierre Thomas, there really wasn't any depth. And losing him, it, it's if you want to look at it kind of uh, contrastingly, us losing Pierre Thomas in that playoff game can I, I can draw a lot of parallels to the Atlanta game the first Atlanta game a year ago when mm-hmm. we lost Camara in the opening stage. Of course, when we lost Thomas, we didn't have a Mark Ingram behind him. But the no, he offense was, was he the IR. offense was so predicated on building off of what Camara was doing at that point in the season, the straight ahead uh pound in yardage that they were trying with Mark Ingram wasn't going to work. Well, Ingram Ingram was on an injured reserve. He got hurt. Um, I want to say it was a Giants game. He got hurt. Or it was right around that time in 2011. And he was put on IR. <clears throat> Pierre Thomas gets knocked out. And Chris Ivory had against that 49ers defense. Chris Ivory could not get anything going. So the Saints went to a more vertical passing game. And this is where I, you know, I don't want to go into that game anymore because that game is painful enough to think about. But it was such a momentum changer when Whitner knocked out Pierre Thomas and they recovered a fumble because before that play happened, the Saints are rolling. The Saints are moving that ball at will on the 49ers. And you could see on their face, because that was the kind of offense that 2011 had. Um, um, rolling. It comes. It's the avalanche. And we just got to ride through this avalanche. When they stopped us, and they were able to not only keep us from scoring, and they started getting the ball and started getting the turnovers, because now... Because we lost the screen game, because we lost the diversity that Pierre Thomas offered us in the running and passing game, the 49 was able to get a lot of turnovers. I think they got five in that game, and yep. we didn't score until near the end of the first half. Um, so, I, you know, that kind of stuff, that season with Pierre Thomas – I thought losing Pierre Thomas in 2010 before that Seattle game hurt us. And that was part of the reason why we lost that Seattle game. Because if you have a healthy Pierre Thomas, that whole game, there is no beast mode run. Because Seattle's offense would not be able to keep up with that Saints offense. Um, So they wouldn't be able to run the football. The only reason why they're able to run the football And because they had the lead, Mayor Thomas in the Super Bowl scores the first touchdown after the onside kick. That's what made Ambush the legendary play because not only do you get the onside kick, but you take the lead right there. Well, I think you take the lead. I think that was when they, I don't, I can't believe, I can't remember the exact score. I know they had six. Yeah, we took the lead 13 to 10. It was yep. 10 to 6. We took the lead right there. And it was such a huge play because it was a screen pass. You know, and it was just so beautifully set up. So, yeah, I mean, Pierre Thomas to me was a no-brainer as far as being a Hall of Famer. Um, well, let me ask you this. Well, let me ask you this. Okay. If you had to pick the um, the play, if 
if it was up to you to choose one video play to put on the screen as he's being mm-hmm. enshrined, the play that epitomizes his tenure in New Orleans, what would it be? Um, it's either the Super Bowl run or the screen pass because that was just so beautiful. Um, or, see, the hard part, I thought the uh, the the division champ. I mean, the, uh, yeah, the NFC Championship game, Pierre Thomas had such a huge role in that game too. But it's not, it was a combination of things. I wouldn't want to show that screen pass in the, uh, in the NFC Championship game because then you get people looking at it in slow motion going, oh, see, his knee touched before he broke the plane. And it kind of takes away from that touchdown. But, you know, you think about that game in twenty uh, in the uh, 2009 NFC Championship game. You think about uh, Pierre Thomas sc- scoring the touchdown with the screen pass in the second half. Um, that was the first drive again in the second half. You think about the fourth and inches play. You know, he gets that one. And you think about what set that drive up in overtime. Because Courtney Roby got hurt. Yep. Uh, in that, in the uh, beginning of the, uh, no, right before they went to overtime, at the end of the fourth quarter, Courtney Roby got hurt in the last kickoff return. Pierre Thomas now has to return that kick, and he's the one that took it out. I think got it to the thirty-five or forty-yard line to 40, set up forty-two. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So he set up that drive. To give us a short field to kick the field goal to win the ball game, so I mean, there's so about that that game that you know play of that game. So I would have to go with the Super Bowl screen pass because it's got to be a screen, bigger screen pass than it was in the one in the Super Bowl. And of course, he's leaping into an end zone that's painted for the Saints. So that yeah. I mean, to me, that's yeah. a that's that's the best play. That's the one play I would show for his highlight. For me, it would be I, I had a hard time deciding between two plays, and neither of them come from the Super Bowl. The two plays that epitomize uh, Pierre Thomas's tenure in New Orleans are, and you mentioned them both. First was the kickoff return. And to me, you can make whatever you want to out of it, but to me, that just kind of goes to prove that Pierre Thomas was any player that you needed him to be. He was a running back. He was a receiver. He was a Mm -hmm. return. He was whatever you needed him to be. And he was just as committed slash effective at doing whatever you asked him to do. The versatility uh, that he showed was the hallmark of his career in New Orleans, in my opinion. Um, The other was the fourth and one play where he went over the top and got it. Because you have to understand, uh, and these people now, they have a hard time fathoming just what the concept of, if we don't make this first down on the other sidelines as a player wearing number four named Brett Favre. And, yeah, he just choked on that last play, but he's getting ready to come back out here and and push it right down our throats to get to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So if Pierre Mm -hmm. Thomas doesn't pick up that first down, history changes. Because rather than the Saints going Mm -hmm. down and kicking the field goal, the Saints likely punt and – They turn the ball over and down. They turn the ball yeah. over on deck. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Where was my head? Uh, he doesn't make that first down. The uh, the Vikings get the ball right there with a pissed off Brett Favre mm-hmm. going to work, needing maybe two first downs, maybe 20, 25 yards before his team is in position to kick the game winning field goal, just like we did. Yeah. So they, there's there's no way to overemphasize just exactly how huge that fourth and one play was for the mm-hmm. Saints. Uh, 
And if he obviously if he doesn't get it, uh, there's no uh, Reggie Bush running over Gumbo. There's no uh, Gatorade baths. There's no uh, confetti falling from the Superdome. And, and Sean, there's sure as hell not a trip to Miami. No, Sean Payton's roasted for that decision. He is roasted by fans for that decision. Absolutely. And chances are, come back to coach. Well, he comes back to coach the Saints one more year. And then if they're not, if they're not in the NFC Championship game or trying for the Super Bowl, fans are ready to run him. If. Pierre Thomas doesn't convert that play. Yeah, the history is very different. Lance Moore, on the other hand, you know, that's a tough one. And again, I think it's because they were going with the theme of two undrafted players going in together, uh, two guys who really started, you know, I hate this phrase, but started from the bottom and now they're up here, you know, uh, Lance Moore's route because you look at he came in during the Katrina year uh, was on the practice squad uh, came in 2006 didn't do a whole heck of a lot in fact they had him returning kicks he alternated with Reggie Bush returning kicks back then and he wasn't very good at it uh, um, I mean he could catch but he wasn't explosive or anything like that and you saw that even in 2007 you know he had he would go up, he would go back and return kicks, and he wasn't. That's part of the reason why we got uh, Courtney Roby uh, from the Titans is because we lacked an explosive kick returner. Um, so Lance Moore really paid his dues and became a better receiver to justify his position on the roster. So from that standpoint, I said, okay, I can see him being included in the Saints Hall of Fame because he was very much like a a more talented Rich Marty for the old school Saints fans. You know, the blue collar guy, the blue collar guy who uh, just did whatever they, the team, just like you were talking about Reg, with Pierre Thomas, did whatever the team asked him to do. He's going to go out there and do it. You want me to play Gunner? I'll play Gunner. You want me to return kicks? I'll return kicks. You want me to play the a third and fourth receiver, I'll go out there and do that. You know, but more I felt was a little more talented, a little better receiver than uh, Rich Marty was. Rich Marty was really just that hardworking blue-collar guy that the fans kind of rallied around. So, you know, I, from that standpoint, I can see it because you can't look at a, a Lance Moore – purely from a statistical standpoint and justify him being in the Hall of Fame because if he's in there, then, you know, Robert Meacham's going to go in, Devery Henderson's going to go in. Uh, you know, it, you start, you know, you could make an argument even that uh, Willie Jackson belongs in because Willie Jackson had that incredible playoff game. Well, the first playoff win, I mean, Joe Horn gets knocked out and Willie Jackson has the game of his life. Uh, you know, so, and, and that's, I think, and, and go back to Lance Morgan, I think, you know, the two-point play in the Super Bowl, of course, that was Lance Moore's play. Um, he makes the huge difference to make it a seven-point game that late, you know, so now the Colts can't just drive for a field goal or burn the clock off. They've got to score a touchdown just to tie. So, you know, it, it's – I can that's the, that's the reasons why I can see Lance Moore being in it, even though statistically he really doesn't deserve even the Saints Hall of Fame. You know, it sounds like I'm my, bashing the guy. I'm really not, but it does. <laughs> I hope you never have to write my eulogy, man. Oh, oh. no. <laughs> I know. It's terrible, huh? My – well, I gave you my uh, my Pierre Thomas play. I'm going to give you my Lance Moore play, and you made mention of it. Uh, there were there were a lot of plays over the years that Lance Moore just defied description on, but I think the one play that stands out, in at least in my mind, more than any other is the two point conversion in the Super Bowl, because uh, the Herculean effort that it took 
to to get to the ball, to secure the ball, to cross the plane of the goal line with the ball. It every receiver can't do what Lance Moore did on that play. You know, yeah. And if I had to pick a play, my favorite Lance Moore play, not counting the Super Bowl, my because. You know, if you think about that 2009 season, you kind of forget that Lance Moore was injured for much of it. You know, because the years kind of blend together, and Lance Moore had a great, I think it was 2008, because Holston was hurt. 2008. Uh, Lance Moore had a great year that year. He got injured in 2009, I think after the Giants game, uh, and then he comes back and has a huge play in the Super Bowl, the famous sound bite, you know, where Sean Payton calls a play and he says, I want Lance Moore. You know, he calls him out and tells him the formation and everything. Um, I think in the 2011 season, I really, really started to enjoy Lance Moore in that offense because, again, you know, that offense was clicking so much. That Minnesota game in 2011, we just kicked the ever-living crap out of that team in the Metrodome. And there's one play where Lance Moore did just runs a shallow cross, you know, over the middle, you know, then he gets it, you know, just a little dump off pass, should have been a little seven, eight yard gain, and he just takes it to the house. And you just watch all the Vikings players with their hands on the hips, like, what the hell just happened? And Lance Moore does some kind of bizarre robot looking <laughs> dance in the end zone. After that, you know, I don't even know the name. I don't know the names of any of these dances they do, but, um, you know, but I mean, to me, that was the quintessential Lance Moore. You gave him a little, he took a lot, and celebrated the end of it. So, I mean, that, you know, a non-critical game that Lance Moore against the Vikings in 2011, that's probably my my definitive Lance Moore play, and you got to show the dance at the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, 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 just as much as I can remember looking forward to the season and uh, posting all this stuff on Houdat Nation Redemption – which was like a forerunner of the Under the Dome podcast <laughs> Facebook page. Uh, posting, I, I can't wait to see what he does in the end zone this year because he was always going to celebrate. And if I'm not mistaken, most every time it was probably different. Mm -hmm. It was. It was different dance every time. It was something new he was going to do in every single – Every trip to the end zone, he did something different. And he was, you know, what? Go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you go ahead right there. Uh, Lance Moore wasn't born uh, with the Julio Jones skill set. He he didn't um, he didn't have the the size of a Marcus Colston. He didn't have the speed of Randy Moss or uh, or Jerry Rice, but he worked his butt off, and he earned respectability. And I, I think he's very deserving of this honor. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know. get into the semantics of uh, does he over does he deserve over? I, I'm not into that, you know. Uh, I, I don't make the decision as to who goes in and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. I make the decision who I support and who I who I believe has earned it. Um, I, I I do believe that um, scoring the two point conversion in the Super Bowl probably carried a lot of weight on some of the voters' minds. Uh, but even without that, I, I believe in all honesty and uh, and humility. I, I do believe that. Lance Moore deserves to be there. Uh, he had a he came in as an undrafted free agent, as did Pierre Thomas. And most people don't realize, even under a coach like Sean Payton, people don't really grasp exactly how long a, and uh, involved a road it is to make it as a regular uh, semi-every-down player. Uh, we'll even say a situational uh, option player, as most receivers these days are. 
in, in this league at, to do that via the undrafted free agent route is becoming increasingly rare because everybody well, wants a pedigree nowadays. Yeah. It, you know, the, here's the thing too, with the saints offense, um, you're not just, okay. Like Mar- Marcus Colston wasn't just the X receiver and Lance Moore wasn't just a Z receiver. And, you know, uh, Levery Henderson wasn't just a slot guy. And, you know, it, it's not how it works. You have to know all the routes. You have to know all the positions. And if you think about that offense, uh, the 2009 offense, how interchangeable all the players were. And how many of them had, like, if I just went down the list and I told you, okay, what's your quintessential Marcus Colston play from 2009? you probably could come up to two or three plays that you could think of that were quintessential Marcus Colston plays. Uh, off the top of my head right now, um, the New England game. New England fights back, gets the – finally scores the touchdown, gets the, you know, gets, the, uh, gets the game relatively close. Three plays later, the Saints are scoring another touchdown. And the first play – is a little back shoulder throw to Marcus Colston. And he just gallops about 60 or 65 yards to get him inside the 20 again. I mean, and that's what started that drive. So, you know, that's you know, that's Colston in 2009. That's what he did, you know. Um, in uh, for, for Devery Henderson, of course, the Washington game. I'm, I'm sorry, not Devery Henderson. Uh, Robert Meacham, of course, the yeah. Washington game. You know, yeah. he steals the ball. Uh, Devery Henderson, the uh, again New England game, yeah, you know, yeah. wide open, blown coverage, and Devery Henderson just scores a touchdown. I mean, you in the Super. Bowl. So I think that's why you're going to see, before it's all said and done, almost everybody from that roster in the Saints Hall of Fame, just because that's that was the team. That each player had their moment. Um, Jeremy Shockey, if I asked you to just to uh, summarize Jeremy Shockey's 2009 season, what play would you think of? Uh, there were I'll so few what, to I, pick from. <laughs> well, I could tell you which one I can remember the most. It, right off the top of my head, I would have to say him getting a touchdown against his former employers uh, okay. in the Giants game. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. Him getting a touchdown in the Super Bowl, unlike a lot of people, um, you know, I, I can appreciate the fact that he finally got that Super Bowl touchdown. Where it was in the game, it was more of an afterthought than, say, the Pierre Thomas touchdown. Well, uh, it's a two because the next play is a two point conversion, so. You know, it was a, it was a huge play. I don't like Shockey, so it's probably got something to do with it. Well, if I pick the Shockey play <laughs> from two thousand nine, it's against the Miami Dolphins, where he catches that little pass over the middle, and then he hand checks and fights with that guy for a good thirty yards down the field. We just see him shoving the guy, trying to get him off. Now he doesn't score, and. That was in that fourth quarter where the Saints come back and win the ball game against the Dolphins. That was the drive where Drew scored the quarterback sneak, yes. wasn't it? Yes, it is. It is. That's how they got down there. Um, yeah, but but you know that was that was his moment. Symbolized how the Saints were in that ball game. That they you know they should have just rolled over and died, especially after that first half, where it just wasn't their game. But no. Oh, they come back and Shockey just fighting that guy off to get all the yards he can, his broken body can get. You know that's his play. Um, to if I go, Dave Thomas, the, the other tight end. The play again. This is the New England game because that New England game is so great for so many reasons. But you know where John Gruden practically loses. Okay, let's keep this family. John Gruden loses his mind um, when the Saints ran 
the you know the it wasn't a Statue of Liberty play, but it was a middle screen to uh, Dave Thomas where Breeze fakes it one way, turns around, fakes it the other way, and then he throws over the middle to Dave Thomas, and John Gruden just loses his mind like he can't believe that play just got run. You know, and, you know, you know how Gruden was about Breeze and Peyton to begin with. He's like, they run the middle screen, and, you know, you could just hear him say all this stuff. So, I mean, that was my play for Dave Thomas, Reggie Bush, you know, his his uh, Cardinals playoff win where he just took over. Uh, yeah. That was a, that was his that was his play that year. So, you know, you can see where all these guys going to come into the Hall of Fame and then everyone's going to think about that one play from that season, that whole magical season that, you know, defined that team. You knew that this was going to be a special team. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 going to be fun. We're going to see a lot of these. We're going to have a lot of these moments over the next couple of years where you see pairs of, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised to see Porter and Greer going together. And I wouldn't be yeah. surprised to see, you know, uh, Harper going in with, um, maybe Harper going in with, um, uh, he just retired and uh, Zach Streif, you know, uh, because they are part of that 2006 draft class. Or uh, maybe Harp, maybe Streif goes in with Evans. You never know, you know, because yeah. Streif just retired this year. Evans will probably retire. I don't know if he's going to play this year or not with the Packers. He may retire next year, but I could see those two going to get ahead, that communication going on with each other. So, yeah. Oh, it's it's the Super Bowl. We have another Super Bowl, but you know, you're going to see a lot of that kind of stuff going on over the next few years in the Saints Hall of Fame. Well, shifting gears a little bit, we mm -hmm. got a, uh, and we encourage everyone. It, you have an infinite well of knowledge, not on this side of the screen, but on on, on the River Ridge side of the screen. You have an um, well if you have, especially now at this, uh, what we call the dead point of the season, uh, we're here for you guys. Is there something historically that you've always wondered that you'd like to know that I guess we're going to have to call it ask the professor. Um, <laughs> You're on Mr. Peabody's way back machine. Yeah, it is. We're going to start this off by, uh, we've, we got to, a question and and I thought it was kind of intriguing so I wanted to ask Alan uh for his thoughts on it excuse me the question was in the 50 plus years of the Saints New Orleans Saints franchise what do you consider to be the most important year <laughs> the the obvious answer is going to be well the 2009 season because they won the Super Bowl. But I'm going to go back a little bit further than that because Tom Benson bought this team in 1985. And if you look at the first 20 years of this franchise or 19 years of this franchise under John Meekham, you know, it's it's comedic how awful they were and how bad it was run. I mean, you had an astronaut as a general manager. You had a, a semi-pro head coach. You can be in that team. Um, so when Tom Benson bought the team in 1985, um, he, the first thing he did before that 86 season, because he kind of just let things stay the way they were, is he tried to learn the business because he wasn't even a football fan when he bought the team in 85. He didn't know anything about football. He had to learn, you know, what, what, what how that worked. Uh, what's the draft? How does this work? Um, all the things that we take for granted about the NFL, Benson had to learn these things. So Bum Phillips helped him out tremendously. Um, so 1986, I really consider the first year of Tom Benson's ownership because that's when Tom Benson 
put his stamp on the team. So, yeah, I'm going to say that 86 season is probably the most important season because that's when it became evident that Mo Larry and Curly were no longer running the franchise. He hires Jim Finks as general manager in, uh, in January of that year. Jim Finks turns around and hires Jim Mora. And then they go on to have the best draft in Saints history. Probably 81 is the only other draft that comes close to that. These are the players. Now, this is the first. I'm going to go through. Um, while there was 12 rounds, I'm going to go just through the five rounds with this team. Jim Dombrowski, first-round draft pick. Dalton Hilliard, running back from LSU, second-round pick. Ruben Mays, third-round pick. Pat Swilling, the other third-round pick. Barry Word, another third-round pick. So he picked three running second and third round, but that makes sense. We had back then was an aging Bum Phillips. Uh, I'm sorry, not Bum Phillips. Bum Phillips' son, Earl Campbell. Get her. Aging Earl Campbell. I think Wayne Wilson was still on the team back then. Uh, so he really had no running back depth whatsoever. Kelvin Edwards in the fourth round, the wide receiver. Reggie Sutton, who was an outstanding defensive back, but he couldn't stay with cocaine. That was in the fifth round. So, you know, right off the bat, look at these look at these players. How many of these in the Saints Hall of Fame? Dombrowski, Hilliard, yep. Mays, Swilling. Okay. Later on in the seventh round, you get Gil Finnerty, uh, who was a critical running back for us in the nineteen ninety one season. Um, he saw he just counted the heads back then in eighty six and said, you know what, I ain't making this team. I'm going to go play Antonio Gibson. Uh, um, in 80, you brought in 85, I think you've been uh, on Johnson, Sam Mills, and USFL players combined with that draft class. We, it was no longer East, as that was a nickname for the Bum Phillips years. Um, it was no longer you know, the guys, uh, either players that were too old or that were getting ready to retire or never players. You brought in that stability. And the 86 season, you know, from a, uh, a, you know, statistical standpoint, they finished 79. They started the season one and five. Uh, I'm sorry, one and four. Uh, they ended the season one and four. Um, but in the middle there, you started to see this team kind of gel and figure out an identity and become a consistent, uh, a much more consistent team than the seven, uh, 79 teams of Bum Phillips and of even Dick Nolan. You know, 79, 8, and 8 teams of Dick Nolan. Um, you just saw a much more a much better team, much younger. You could see where all this talent was going to eventually become a strong franchise. You didn't expect to go 12 and 3 in 87, but you thought that this team was the kind of team that could take Take that next step and become a winning franchise. And so, yeah, I would say the 86 season is probably the most important season in the Saints history because if that if Tom Benson doesn't hire a Jim Finks and Tom Benson doesn't bring in a Jim Moore and he tries would sit through that. I think, you know, that team then 
fans wouldn't go run office around and turn the head coaching staff around and a great draft class. That's what gave the fans confidence. That's what propelled the Saints fans to start selling out games and the who that nation is born and all that stuff. I got to agree with you. With um, you. Um, it, the 86 it, season with the turnover and ownership, as you just spoke in great detail about, the only thing that in my mind would come even remotely close to that would be not a change in ownership nearly so much as a change in direction, philosophy, um, and for all uh, intents and purposes, a, a change in results that began um, in the 06 season when uh, when Sean Payton came aboard. Yeah. And, and if you look back, and I, you know, in my heart of hearts, yes, I, I think that Tom Benson taking over ownership of the team was a a that is that is the most important time. Uh, the uh, but I, mm -hmm. I don't want to discount or um, diminish just exactly what it meant to this city, to this state, to this franchise, to this organization. When it happened, Sean Payton coming in here. Sean Payton was a career assistant. Uh, the Giants, um, several college jobs, then the Giants, then the Cowboys, never been a head coach before. Uh, and up to that point, the New Orleans Saints really had no, nothing played, to lose. He has played call. And Say that again. Can you repeat that? Play out? calling. Take Jim, oh, Jim Fossil took away Sean Payton's play calling. Uh, his last year with the Giants, Dallas, um, because the offense wasn't wasn't organized, wasn't doing what they should have been doing, and Jim Fossil took over the play calling. So Sean I mean, Payton that was the play caller in that New York Giants Super Bowl versus yes, the Ravens. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. He was. But in Peyton's last year with the Giants, Jim Fossil took away the play calling duties from Peyton because he thought, you know, as Bill Parcells got, said it, you know, he got the virus. You know, he would get, he'd start getting cute when Fossil wanted to get, just play Giants football. You know, trying that double reverse to a tight end for a first down. You know, trying to throw the ball when it, you should run the football and the Giants turning the ball over and things like that. Um, you know, so playing that extra year, uh, going to be with Bill Parcells and being Parcells' offensive coordinator, I think kind of made Peyton, well, I know it did. It made him a better coach. It got him to understand and better on how to be a head coach. Sure. Uh, it, it's on like you? on the on the job training. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're having buffering issues again. Um, I that. Um, though on the 2006 season, if I picked another season, two. 2006 season, uh, other important season because, and, and I hate to say it, this doesn't hit. Hazel doesn't lose his job. We have another year of him. We have to figure out what we're going to do after Aaron Brooks. Sean, uh, Drew Brees doesn't come. Sean Payton doesn't come. And Remember that there was real talk about the Saints having to expand, rename the franchise, maybe the Gulf Coast Saints, you know, or something to that effect to become like New England, you know, expand to 
encompass an area to draw port for the club. You know, because they weren't selling games out. You know, it was relying on banks to buy the tickets. Um, <clears throat> in really rough shape um, before Katrina hit. You know, so I can see. That's why I could say the 2006 season because that starts the the golden age of Saints football for us. I agree with that. I could see the 2006 season here. I, I, the re, another reason for me picking the 2006, uh, and, and I, I just recently uh, came to this conclusion. You know, had the Saints not finished the way that they did and not wound up in Chicago for the NFC Championship game, then there's a very, very real possibility that we're not still looking at Sean Payton in New Orleans right now. Yeah. Yeah. Because that could have turned because, out so uh, very much differently. I agree. I agree because that was a that was a make or break year because Paul Tagliabu gave the Saints uh, um basically a year Saints fans really a year to prove it. Otherwise, he was going to let Tom Benson move the team. Because, again, like we were talking about, you know, where they were going to have to appeal to more regard a new stadium. So let's talk about building a new stadium in Mississippi and have, you know, the Saints become the Gulf Coast Saints with a stadium like, you know, Bay St. Louis or somewhere around there just outside the New Orleans area. And that would have been a disaster for New Orleans. Um, yeah. That would have been, that would not have been a positive thing. Um, so, yeah, there was a, a lot of that stuff. We'd have to talk about, we're going to have to talk about this one time. A whole we're gonna have to. We're going to have to get Joe back on sometime uh, and have him kind of uh, walk us through what it was like to be on the team at that point in time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, we could pick some others, so we could pick <laughs> next time. Let's talk about one of the years that we'd rather forget. What was the worst year for the Saints outside of 1980? Uh, what was the one of the worst years for the franchise? And there's a few years to choose from. Uh, you could just spend a whole hour just in the dick of years alone, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, there's a couple of there's a I'd like to talk about the 1993 New Orleans Saints season one year because that was a that was the turning point for Jim Moore, the 2002 season for the Saints under Jim Hazlitt. That was a turning point year for him. Um, you know the 1980 1979 season, how that set up the 1980 season. Um, Hell, the 1975 and 77 seasons. Those are two years that, you know, 75 in particular practically set the Saints back to the Stone Age. Uh, how bad that season. Um, and that was the first year in the Dome, too. But uh, there's a well, few. Let and then, of course, you, let me ask you something. Ask you something. Mm -hmm. we, everyone has these uh, doomsday expectations for quote unquote the day that Drew leaves. Uh and we've we've entertained that train of thought far too often on here because it's it's all just merely speculation. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, it kind of uh it's kind of understood that when a franchise loses a veritable first ballot Hall of Fame quarterback that they go back to the drawing board and back to ground zero and start all over. Do you ever see the Saints returning to hard times? Somebody asked me that a long time ago, like in the 1991-92 seasons. And my answer back then was, well, no, no, because, you know, uh, Tom Benson's got the right people in place and, you know, he's not going to let that happen. Jim Moore's too good of a coach. 
all those things. And you really, I, I, I can't make that prediction because too many things can happen. Um, you know, key people could leave the team, although I have to give Peyton credit for this. He's really managed to rebuild a very young core around an aging quarterback. So the unlike Jim Moore's teams in 1991 and 92, which were kind of running out of gas by then because you've had the players from the 81 draft class, the USFL, and even the 86 draft class starting to reach the end of their careers as football players. Um, because 93, uh, after the 93 season, Vaughn Johnson's gone. Vaughn Johnson started getting hurt a little bit more in the 93 season. He's gone by 94. Pat Swilling's gone by 93. Ricky Jackson's in San Francisco by 94. So there's the core of that defense. Uh, 93 season, you saw Hobie Brenner retire. You saw um, Jim Wilkes, who was the centerpiece of that defensive line, retire. Um, Eric Martin was near the end of his career. Dalton Hilly was at the end of his career. Um, you know, you saw a lot of that team got old together fast. We've kind of gone through that already with uh, Sean Payton. We kind of went through the, the old players from that, I think 2013 was the last real year of that core group of, you know, Jonathan Vilma, um, Marcus Colston, Devery Henderson, Lance Moore, Pierre Thomas, all these players that we're starting to see now in the, uh, in the Saints Hall of Fame. Um, you know, we kind of weeded those players out and let them go, went through the seven and nine seasons. And now because of Jeff Ireland, we've had these two good draft classes where you've got Michael Thomas entering his third year, um, Kamara entering his second year. Cam Jordan and uh, and uh, Mark Ingram are the technically the old guys now, outside of Drew Brees, of course. But, you know, there's nobody left in the 2006 draft class. You know, all these guys that are starting this offensive line that the Saints have drafted – are all guys that, you know, have been with the team since maybe 2015, 2014. You know, um, there's not – it's not an old group of players. So, yes. Was Morstead part of that uh, 06 class? 09. Or was he 07? He was 09. He was a he was rookie. A rookie he was a rookie in the Super Bowl year, yeah. Yep. So – with that being a young group of a young core of players, and you keep adding young players to it, you know, look at that secondary. Um, that secondary, the entire secondary is guys, except for Kirk Coleman, who's a new person, but I'm talking about the, the starters, are all guys that joined this team in the last three years. Um, you know, you just see this incredible youth movement, that offensive line, except for Max Unger is you know a young group um that's that's huge so the key would be is okay who is going to be the next quarterback after breeze or is he a future starter that will determine to me if the saints go back to the closest we've been to the hard times the 79 seasons that's a long answer, I know, but that's the difference between what happened to Jim Morris' teams at the end versus what Sean Payton has done. You no, know? It, it makes total, it makes sense. total sense. sense. This is a very this much is, a quarterback-driven very... league. What happens on the field is oh, primarily dependent on who you have play in that position. And, and yep. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on which side of the, uh, the spectrum you fall on, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm very optimistic. I don't think we'll get in the hard times, but enough key injury managers leave. Uh, Jeff Ireland leaves. Um, you know, it, it all... Go change, but they have 
done what no other Saints coach has ever done, and that's rebuild a strong star core or successfully replace these players. So that's huge. I mean, that's that's uncharted. This is all uncharted territory, like everything else that Sean Baton has done with this team. Yeah, but I mean. Uh, he's he's already the longest tenured coach in New Orleans. Uh, oh yeah, and before he's, how far does he have to go to reach the the winningest coach? He's got a pass. Yeah, he has. Moore, right? No, he already has. He's passed. He passed Jim Moore last year. He years ago total record because of the playoff wins and everything else. But I think he just passed. He passed Jim Moore for the season win. I think he um, – I have to go back and look. He should be either at 100 wins or over 100 wins as a head coach. Let me see. This is going to screw gonna up the system. I'm going to say over. Uh, I'm, I'm calling myself remembering seeing him passing 100 late last season. Let me just see. Please do, because uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, he's a hundred and five and seventy one as a head coach. So that means uh, is that playoffs included? Is, I mean, is that? I'm, I'm looking right now. Twelve. Um, five. Twelve games total in the playoffs. He's seven and five. Um, no, it does not include the playoffs. So he's over a hundred wins. Um, I think that's what. This is kind of hard to make out because look at football stat reference.com. And if you look at 105, he's coached 176 games. Um, yeah, he's 105, 71, and 0.597 winning percentage. He said 12 playoff games, 7 5 record in the playoffs. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's his wins, Damn, his I win total. He would, he would have a better playoff record than that. Well, you got to think about it. Uh, every playoff, every playoff season ends with a loss. So, how many playoffs? <laughs> except for except for two thousand and nine. No, really. I mean, except for two thousand and nine. Think about it. every yeah. time we went to the playoffs. Two thousand six ends with a loss. That's one. Two thousand nine doesn't end with a loss. Two thousand ten does. That's another loss. Two thousand eleven ends with a loss. Two thousand thirteen ends with a loss. And last year ended with a loss. So there's five losses there. But um. I mean, it's better than Jim Morris' playoff record, which is zero and four, and Jim <laughs> Haslett is one in uh, one in one. The Jim Morris speech mm -hmm. playoffs. He was in Indianapolis when that happened, was he not? Yep, yep. They lost to the San Francisco Forty Niners. I got in got the darndest fight the other day because somebody was arguing me up and down. No, that was what got him fired from New Orleans. No, that's deadly poo. <laughs> Everybody knows did speed. <laughs> that was the deadly. Remember that speech? That's the one. You know, I, I that is like the ultimate meltdown. You know, after that game, I'm like, he's gone. He's quitting because he was just <laughs> he had lost his mind because Sam Mills. He never wanted to see leave, destroy his team in Carolina. And he comes out and says, we couldn't do diddly poo. Um, we couldn't run the ball. We tried to run the ball. You know, we, we suck. suck. That was a, yeah, that's, that's his, that's, that's his, that's his meltdown with New Orleans. The coulda, woulda, shoulda was 87 and the diddly poo. Uh, was the end of it. I mean, in between there, you had the, you know, 93, him losing his mind because the fans were cheering 
uh, when Wade Wilson got hurt. <laughs> I was like, he was disgusted. You know, there's sick people. Um, and then there's a few others in there. You know, you got him. him. Go look up New Orleans. Blooper. Jim Moore meltdowns on YouTube. You get to see some classic one. I saw one. With him and Ron Svoboda. Um, I, I think that's the one I was taught. Uh, what, the one I saw was him and uh, some New Orleans reporter. I mean. Ron Svoboda. Mora made him look like an absolute fool. Mora hated him. Uh, that was Ron Swoboda. Now he, uh, for for those who may not remember, Ron Swoboda played with the '69 Mets. He was a baseball player, and that was his claim to fame. Was he was a member of the '69 Mets, and um, he was a reporter for New Orleans. And for whatever reason, he and Jim Mora would just go at each other, and that's. That's the two that you, you normally see, him going after Ron Swoboda, because he always had a good relationship with um, the Channel 4 sports reporters, you know, the, the, the CBS affiliate here. He had a good relationship with Mike Haas, had a good relationship with Jim Henderson, of course. He had a good relationship with all the reporters they ever had. Um, but Ron Swoboda was his personal nemesis, almost. That was the guy who somehow managed to post push – Mora's buttons, and that's where you would get that kind of reaction. Kenny Wilkerson used to do it too, but it wasn't like Ron Swoboda. Ron Swoboda really knew how to piss Mora off. Um, so yeah, that that was it. There was a highlight of you know Sean Payton's press conferences. You could almost do those verbatim because you know he's going to say. That being hey, said, look, hey, look. yeah, hey, look, we we'll have to look at the film. Uh, that being said, um, I used to have a whole list of all his favorite phrases. Jim Moore had no favorite fl- phrases. He would just go off. If you, if you asked a question in a certain way and he didn't like the way you asked that question, that was it. You didn't know what he was going to say. Uh, you know, his, um, you don't know, you th- think you know, really d- don't know and you never will that kind of stuff um you know him getting all pissed off you know after a practice where the kansas city chiefs beat the hell out of the saints in mankato and you know 92 season the saints went 12 and 4 that year but because of scrimmage in mankato or not mankato in uh, lacrosse against the chiefs you know he's like you know uh they have better team you know they you know their best, Tommy Stowers, a tight end they got from the Chiefs, like the player of the game. The Chiefs cut him before the Saints signed him. He was like the star of the day for the Saints. He wasn't good enough to make that team. Guess that changed the difference between their team and ours. It's like, God, who says that kind of stuff? But he just lays it out there, brutally honest. You know, awesome stuff. Yeah, but that was the playoffs it was that was in the uh that was with the Colts and he got fired that fired later that year he got fired after that press conference no it was it was after the end of the season which Are was ironic sure? because mm-hmm. yeah because that was just a question they they were good enough to make the playoffs still cuz they had a record you know they had a good enough record to make the playoffs if they would have kept winning, and that's why Jim Moore went off. But their defense was terrible, and Moore got fired because he wouldn't fire his defensive coordinator. Well, you know who his defensive coordinator was? Vic Fangio, the guy who was defensive coordinator for the 49ers, defensive coordinator now for the Bears. He was the Saints linebackers coach during the Dome Patrol years for Jim Moore. Uh, it, they didn't have the talent. It wasn't wasn't the coach. He just didn't have the talent to be a good a good defense. But he wouldn't they, fire uh, Carl Smith in New Orleans. Is what got him run out of here on the uh, Yeah, that 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 kind of. Yeah, I mean that was it didn't, help. It didn't help. Carl Smith was you know the um what was his name that, you know, that all the coaches at Jim Moore that, uh, that people thought Sean Payton were buddy buddies with, you know, the special teams coach, 
the linebackers coach, uh, the defensive line coach. You know, the guys everybody wanted always wanted fired. Jim Carl Smith was the guy they felt was the albatross holding the Saints offense down. And I agree with that to a large extent because Carl Smith was the master of the five yard crossing route on third and seven. You know, um <laughs> I, I've never seen a guy do that where, you know, he always had his receivers run short passing routes when he had a lot of yardage. Like, they were going to make up the difference. And that was that was Carl Smith. But to Carl Smith, and I can't believe I'm saying this because my 20-year-old self is like, what the hell? You know, <laughs> my 20, 25-year-old se uh, internal self the Saints did not have enough offensive weapons to be an explosive offense. Um, Carl Smith was a product of the limited weapons they had on offense. So that's my half-hearted defense of Carl Smith. But that doesn't I, get I'm him, not going to take up for him. That doesn't get him off. That doesn't get him off the hook. You still got to call seven-yard pass routes on third and seven, not <laughs> a five-yard route. And he if would do that. Over if you over can't count over. footsteps, I'll bring somebody in here Monday that can. Oh, my God. We want you to know, thank it. everyone for joining us tonight. We've had a blast. Uh, you yep. know, this this dead time is kind of uh, – the pressure's kind of off for us. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but I, I really uh, – I'm in the same boat as, as the vast majority of our listeners uh, – I don't even remotely claim to be as knowledgeable as my esteemed colleague is on, on a lot of this stuff. Uh, I have opinions and I'm, I'm very happy to say that generally my opinions run parallel to whatever Alan says. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we chalk that up to, he can be taught. Uh, <laughs> We th we thank everyone for joining us tonight. Invite you guys to come back next Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Join us on Facebook at Under the Dome Podcast, on Twitter at Under the Dome PO1. What am I forgetting? Oh, on on YouTube, on iTunes at Under the Dome Podcast. Uh, if you can't find us, find us. We'll we'll get you there. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, you are why we do what we do. Uh, we love you guys. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Good at all. Good night, everybody. Thank you all for once again joining us for Under the Dome. We'll see you next time. Night. <laughs>